Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning and for this time to gather and worship you. God, we just ask that you would send your spirit to circle around each person and each word that is spoken, that God, that you would lay on our hearts what it is that we need to hear today. Hide me, God, in the cross, and that it be your words that are proclaimed. We ask this in your precious son's name. Amen. Over the years, our society has discovered formulas and equations that we have come to depend on. Two plus two equals four. To get the area of a space, you multiply the length times width. Every geometry proof is a sequence of deductions that use the if-then logic. If this, then this. If you don't brush your teeth, then you get cavities. If someone smokes, then they are likely to have breathing issues or even lung cancer. If a football player leads with his helmet in a tackle, then a penalty should be called. If a tropical storm hits your city, then power loss is expected. Today's lessons seem to have this same if-then pattern. But God's word makes what seems logical to our culture be the exact opposite. In other words, here, the predictable pattern does not hold true. God's word turns everything upside down that we think we know. Predictable patterns, logical steps, and changes it all. Take the Hebrews lesson. God's word cuts through all of us and all of our excuses and our denials laying us exposed not to be pushed away from God. Rather, the writer here tells us to approach the throne of grace with boldness because we have a high priest who understands us from the inside out. The high priest was the chief religious official. He alone could offer the sacrifices for sins of himself or the people and of the other priest. If you sin, then take an offering to the high priest for atonement, and he will intercede with God on your behalf. If there's no high priest, then there's no atoning for your sins. But upside down, here we go. Be bold, we are told. We no longer need a high priest to be present to atone for our sin. Jesus is the high priest who intercedes for us. And moving on to Mark's gospel, we have the story that has been named the rich young ruler. The same story is told in the accounts of Mark and of Matthew. And in those accounts, they add the details that the man was young and rich. So he's wealthy and young. Impressive, even by today's cultural standards, wouldn't you say? Now, if you had lots of money, then you were righteous. Wealth meant God favored you. If you were poor, okay, let's I'll try that again. 830 did so good. If you were poor, yeah. there you go, then it was your sin that caused it. So this impressive man bows out of respect to Jesus and perhaps even a true desire to come and be a part of whatever this life-changing movement seemed to be. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And here we go. Jesus turns society upside down again. Jesus answers him with a question. He asks the man how he's been doing in keeping up the commandments. And Jesus rattles off commandments numbers 5 through 9 as examples. Now pause. Numbers 1 through 4 deal with our relationship to God. And commandments number 5 through 10 deal with our relationship with each other. So when reciting this list to the man, Jesus left off number 10. Now, I won't make you Google that or um, look it up real quick. I'll tell you. Number 10 is thou shalt not covet. 
The commandment about desiring to always want more. The commandment that warns us about the power of money and greed. The commandment that says your desires should be about putting your neighbor's wants and needs above your own. The man looked at Jesus and reassures him that since his youth, he's kept all of the ones that Jesus just mentioned. So Jesus looking on the man with love. Did you catch that? He looks at the man with love. And then he tells him, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But the man departs, greatly saddened. In fact, he is the only person recorded who rejects Jesus' direct call to come and follow him. The man could not let go of his acquired wealth. He was hanging on to the world's understandings of God's righteousness. Now, you might be thinking, we've done the old bait and switch. Randy is at Tekoa, and they've sent me in, because you would never suspect it, they've sent me in to preach the stewardship sermon. I assure you that is not the case. In fact, I would offer that this story is far more about discipleship than it necessarily is about money. So, here we are, though, at what seems to be another accepted if-then If we keep the commandments, then we get eternal life. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, if we attend to those in need, if we worship only God, if we don't lie, cheat, or steal, if we love God with everything we've got, then we inherit eternal life. Working and living in all of these ifs is discipleship. If we move through the paces of discipleship, then we will inherit eternal life. But what if there's more here than the idea of inheriting eternal life in some distant reality? What if there's much more here in this passage that alerts us to the now? The minutes and seconds that we live in and breathe in every day. Let's sidetrack for a second and pick apart this eternal life phrase. The concept of an eternal life wasn't in the Jewish vernacular. Rather, the prophets spoke about this age and the age to come. Ages meaning eras or periods of time. The present and the future. This would have been how Jesus would have understood the concept of this age and the age to come. The world we are living in right now, the way things are right now, the oppressive, ruler-driven society, and the world to come. A time period when all was just right with the world. A future where there is peace and prosperity for all. So when the man asks Jesus about the future, this eternal life, the world to come, Jesus wouldn't have been surprised by the question. The future promises were on everyone's mind. The man wanted to make sure he was doing the right things so that in the age to come, he would be a part of the future that God was securing. So what about these treasures in heaven that were promised to the man. What if the treasures stored in heaven weren't for the rich young man to only have in the future age? What if those treasures were just waiting for God to give it to them right now in this age? What if we give God everything and follow and then are able to enjoy these treasures in the present? this age, and the age to come. I think the importance of discipleship is about far more than just working toward the afterlife or working toward our own treasures in an age to come. Disciples should be concerned with this age, this point in time, this 
world now. Just as Jesus looked at this rich young man with love, learning to become a disciple also begins with love. Love for God and love for each other. Actually, we demonstrate our love for God in how we share this love with others. Think about the image of the cross. The vertical piece represents our relationship with God, our beliefs about God. The horizontal piece represents our relationship with each other. How we live out those relationships shows our beliefs about God. We practice discipleship through prayer and Bible study, financial generosity, invitational evangelism, small groups, corporate worship, and utilizing our gifts for others. The more intentional we are at putting our beliefs and actions into practice at the same time, the more transformation we will see. We put our faith into action for transformation so that no child is ever sold as if they are not measurable by money. If we put our faith into action for transformation so that we can reach teenagers who are taking their own life because they don't feel like they belong or that they don't fit in or that somehow this world would be a better place without them. We put our faith into action for transformation so that there is no more racism or sexism or ageism or classism or any other kind of ism that separates people from God. We put our faith into action for transformation because we are overcome with despair from watching the news and feeling helpless as if my prayers for the world are not even being heard when perhaps my prayer needs to be changed change me. We put our faith into action for transformation so our social media posts reflect who we really are and whose we are. We put our faith into action for transformation so that we end all the shares and retreats that divide us and take our focus from preparing for the kingdom of God in this age. These moments of intentionality, that's learning to be a disciple, accepting the call of Jesus to come and follow. Now, we don't ever know what happened to that man. Did he ever end up selling all of his possessions? Would he later be in a crowd that laid palm branches and sang Hosanna? Or was he maybe in the crowd that called out, crucify him? We simply don't know. But what I do know is that Jesus looked on him with love, even as he exposed his sin. I wonder if perhaps someone learning to be a disciple, not by going through any predictable equation but someone putting faith into action for transformation was able to share with him that this same man named Jesus exposed his own physical wounds because he loved him that much. And flipping the world upside down one more time, Jesus leaned into God's word and sang a psalm of comfort. My God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? This psalm starts out pretty stark, pretty doom and gloom. But if you read it in its entirety, the psalm takes the reader through the dark times and makes promises to deliver the future, the age to come, the one where God reigns. Now, I know I'm going to get picked on for this next sermon illustration, and it's okay. But I love watching Dancing with the Stars. I do. Don't judge. And now there's a Dancing with the Stars junior division. Yes, that's right. One of the judges of the junior division is Mandy Moore. And she's one of my favorite choreographers. Well, this past week, she was trying to help one of the junior stars understand how they can stay better on beat. She explained this little dance secret that if you make your movements bigger 
then you won't rush and be offbeat. Bigger movements will really fill up the space and take more time and help you stay on beat. So let me ask, do you ever feel offbeat? Do your movements need to be bigger? Just even, Jesus even left us an example for how to do that. When the man called him good teacher, Jesus' response was to push back. Jesus isn't looking for movements that are full of flattery, full of fluff. He's looking for real movement, the real faith in action for transformation. This gospel lesson leaves us with one more flip in the if-then worldly ways. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So today I ask you to pause. Pause and think where you are in the lineup between last and first. What needs to be exposed? What needs to be sacrificed? What discipleship movements, prayer, Bible study, financial generosity, invitational evangelism, small groups, corporate worship, or utilizing your gifts for others? What discipleship movements do you need to engage in that if you do them, then you will help transform the kingdom in this age and the age to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.